This is Politics Media 101. I'm Jeff Browning. Congressman Bruce Westerman is a Republican from Arkansas who served in the U.S. House of Representatives since 2014. Often in contemporary American politics, when we talk about climate change or natural resources, people generally assume that Democrats are for environmental regulation, assume Republicans are against it, and leave the conversation at that. But managing America's natural resources and setting policy in this area is much more nuanced and complicated than this. The country's forests and waterways and coastlines are vast. They're occupied and used by people from all political stripes. And the impacts of bad natural resources policy affect everyone, regardless of party or views or anything else. Congressman Westerman's background on these issues is very unique among members of Congress. He has a degree in biological and agricultural engineering, as well as a master of forestry from Yale. Right now, he also serves as the top Republican on the House Natural Resources Committee, meaning he's the party's leading member for many policy issues that impact our ecosystems, our lifestyles, and what our future home will look like. He's one of the most knowledgeable, influential, and passionate people around on these issues. He spent almost a full hour speaking with us about them. We had great audience questions, and we hope you enjoy it as much as we did. To learn more about Politics and Media 101 or sign up for our email list, which will deliver our best of directly to your inbox, please visit our website, pm101.live. Please also take a second to subscribe on whichever streaming service you're using right now so you don't miss our next episode coming this Wednesday. Today's episode is one from the Politics and Media 101 archive. It was recorded mid last year. Our co-founder, Justin Higgins, led the interview. Without any further ado, let's roll the tape. Congressman, the first question I always ask elected officials, because it's probably the most important question, is why did you ultimately run for office? Thanks, Justin. That's a question I obviously get asked a lot and quite simply to make a difference. I think that's probably why everybody seeks public office, or at least it's why they should. And I remember growing up and my dad telling me that if you point your finger, there's always three pointing back at you. So if you're pointing out problems, take some responsibility on your own. And I've found in public service, everything from school board to state legislature to now in Congress, that the world is full of problem identifiers. I meet them every day. They tell me what's wrong with the world, but there's very few problem solvers. And, you know, my undergraduate degrees in engineering, and I practiced engineering for about two and a half decades before I, I came to Congress. And really, engineers are problem solvers. I've got a forestry degree as well, so I like to solve problems in the natural resources space. But, uh, you know, I hope that in some way I can make a difference to keep this great tradition of America going that we have, to make sure that we are good stewards of our natural resources and that we leave things in better shape than, than how we found them. That's a fantastic answer. My next question, we've had so far a member on from Michigan, Massachusetts, Connecticut, And not only for this audience from around the U.S., I grew up in New Hampshire, never been to Arkansas, but also we have some international listeners here. Can you describe to us why your district in Arkansas is so awesome? Maybe some of the characteristics, the the food that's the, the popular cuisine, and more importantly, just the nature of the people. You know, Arkansas is known as the natural state. And District 4 that I represent has some of the most natural areas in the natural state. It's absolutely gorgeous. I've been to New Hampshire, beautiful state there. New England is one of my favorite places. But, you know, Arkansas has a lot of similarities to New England, a bunch of forests. We've got a lot of coniferous forests with southern yellow pine. We've also got a lot of deciduous forests, a lot of clear streams, beautiful lakes, a lot of wildlife. Uh, We also have a very productive agriculture industry there in the eastern part of the state, uh, in the Mississippi River Delta. We're the number one rice-producing state in the country. Uh, We also grow a lot of corn and soybeans, and we've got a very robust timber industry in the state as well. And my district is about 87 percent forested, and it's a lot of public lands, private lands, and not just federal public lands, but state public lands. So I've got National Park Service. I actually live in Hot Springs, Arkansas, which is a national park. 
I've got the Washita National Forest, the Ozark National Forest. I've got the Buffalo River, which was our nation's first wild and scenic river. Uh, that's in my district. But we've also got a lot of timber industry, poultry industry, and cattle. And the thing that I love so much about my district is the people there who are just the most genuine down-to-earth people you would ever meet. It's a large geographical area that I cover, but the people are the consistent thing across the district. I was a policy advisor for a member from Kansas, and the farmers were just the hardest working people uh, that I come across. I'm sure it's the same in your district as well. Yeah. And, you know, I told people during the pandemic, my constituents don't have the opportunity to work remotely or not a very large percentage of them do. And had farmers stopped going to work, had people in food processing facilities stopped going to work, had truck drivers quit driving trucks, we would have seen problems much greater than just the illness caused by the pandemic. So I did a hometown heroes tour and I went around and just recognized people who were nominated by their local colleagues for doing something special during the pandemic. And we we recognized everybody from restaurant owners to, you know, local police officers to people who did things like taking folks to the grocery store to pick up orders and helping them order online and, and that sort of thing. So lots of heroes all around us. That is awesome. And I hope that every member of Congress takes your lead and does that because every district has those vital employees that you just mentioned. Now, switching gears a little bit into our meat and potatoes, so to speak, or rice and soybeans uh, of the discussion, we're going to get into energy and environment here. So the first question is, is climate change happening? And what degree do you think humans are contributing to the problem? Climate change is absolutely happening. And the other part of that, it's it's always been happening and always will happen. So that leads into your next question. What contribution has man had in that? And that's probably hard to, to quantify. Probably the easiest data to go to on that is the increase of carbon in the atmosphere. You know, pre-industrial revolution, we were down below 300 parts per million. And then today we're sitting at about 419 parts per million was the latest numbers. And, you know, we started measuring that in Hawaii in the 1950s, and we were already over 300 parts per million, I believe 311 parts per million by the 1950s. So some people may want to discredit the or question the science on going back in the polar ice caps and, and capturing atmospheric carbon levels out of the polar ice caps, but you can't really deny that since we started measuring it in the 1950s, we've gone from 311 to 419 parts per million. So that's roughly 300 gigatons of carbon that's in the atmosphere now that wasn't in the atmosphere before the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. I think that makes a difference. And really, that's what the whole climate discussion is about, is what do we do about these extra levels of carbon that are in, in the atmosphere? And you know, if we could just focus on that, I think we could make some improvements. But, you know, here in D.C., politics gets in the way and emotion gets in the way. And and sometimes we we forget about the science and we forget about common sense and reasoning. Of course. And now moving into the other question, because it's not just climate change that we have to address. How should the government approach addressing climate change, maybe mitigating emissions or other solutions? with also the need to provide not only affordable, but reliable energy to people who really can't afford to pay an arm and a leg to heat their house or run their cars? Yeah, excellent question, Justin. And I think this is where the rub is, because the whole climate slash carbon debate comes back to energy, because it's our energy that's and and certain types of manufacturing that have put the carbon in the atmosphere. Uh, not to mention catastrophic wildfires and other anthropogenic means of of emitting carbon. But what we've got to focus on is what can we do to affect change there? And that's why I've introduced legislation like the Trillion Trees Act, which we all that have had junior high science and know about photosynthesis know that trees are the they're the natural carbon eater. They breathe in carbon dioxide and breathe out oxygen. Teddy Roosevelt called them the lungs of the earth. Uh, so I think 
it's by far the largest scale, most pragmatic, proactive approach to taking carbon out of the atmosphere. But you know, if you get back to this issue on energy and the relationship to carbon and energy, I think that we've got to look at two basic things on, on energy. What is the most economical energy and what is the cleanest energy? And when I say economical, it covers two words that you mentioned, reliability and affordability. Those two components make up what I would call economical energy. What's the most reliable? What's the, the lowest cost or the most affordable? And then how can we make that as clean as possible? The reason that's so important is that everything we do in life depends on energy. If we overprice energy, if we make our energy grid and our energy system non-reliable, uh, we're going to see some great interruptions in, in life and society as we know it. The other part of that is there's a developing world out there that's not always as concerned about what's the cleanest type of energy and maybe not even the most reliable, but what is the lowest cost. So I think the way we can impact global carbon emissions is to be the leaders in, in innovation and research and come up with the energy that is the most reliable and the lowest cost and the cleanest and the, the energy that developing countries adopt, maybe not because it's the cleanest energy, but because it's the lowest cost energy and it's the most reliable energy. Now, otherwise, we could cut off our nose to spot our face here in the U.S. We could work towards zero carbon emissions and possibly achieve that, but it would greatly affect our economy here. And right now, those types of energy systems aren't the lowest cost and I don't believe they're oftentimes the, the cleanest, uh, but they're certainly not what the rest of the world's going to adopt. So I think that leads into, you know, not only wind and solar, but how do we make wind and solar much less expensive where it doesn't require subsidies to make it cost competitive? Nuclear has to be in the equation. It's zero carbon emissions. We have new technology. You know, the next generation nuclear reactors that have solid core cooling systems where you're not reliant on pumps flooding the core with water to keep it cool. These reactors would shut down on their own in a controlled manner. And we have to be open intellectually and from a policy standpoint on these types of, of energy if we want to be intellectually honest and really affect carbon emissions around the world. So I do want to highlight the trillion. Trees Act. I believe that folks in the audience, it is a bipartisan solution headed up by Congressman Westerman here. I want to say the companion bill is being sponsored by uh, Senator Chris Coons from Delaware, who's uh, friends with the President Biden. I hate to do this because this may be a stupid question, but a trillion trees sounds like a lot of trees. Is there enough space to plant a trillion trees? And, and could you just give us a very brief overview of like what you're seeing there and how we would go about implementing that? Yep, another great question. And the answer is yes, there's space to plant a trillion trees. And for your uh, next piece of trivia at your, your party, there's about three trillion trees on the earth right now. Researchers believe we've had as many as six trillion plus trees before. There was a study done by a, a fellow Yale forester was presented at the World Economic Forum that said that if we were to plant a trillion trees globally, and this was by 2050 was the target date, but planting a trillion trees globally would sequester 205 gigatons of carbon, which is two thirds of the carbon that's been emitted by man since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So that was the, the impetus behind the Trillion Trees Act. We have about 300 billion trees in the United States. So obviously we wouldn't be planting a trillion of them here, but we've got plenty of places to plant more trees. And it's not just, you know, like plantation forestry. This is planting a variety of species, planting for the site conditions, planting for, you know, all the objectives that you would try to achieve, whether it's reclamation, whether it's wildlife habitat or combinations of that, or whether it's to plant them to generate timber resources. So you know, we want to plant a lot of trees, but we also want to take care of the forest that we've got because we've already got this tremendous carbon sink in the United States. Another bit of trivia, the forest fires in California last year emitted more carbon than all of the carbon 
emission cuts that have been achieved through all the policy in California since they've been trying to cut emissions. So one year of bad forest fires offsets all of the carbon savings that they've been able to accomplish. So it's critical that we take care of the forests that we have, uh, that we manage them properly to reduce catastrophic wildfire, but also to increase the carbon carrying capacity of those forests. And that's also part of the Trillion Trees Act, as well as something called the Sustainable Building Tax Credit to incentivize making our buildings out of sustainable materials like wood. There's a new product called uh, Mass Timber. It's where you, you make these huge, thick panels out of wood. You can build skyscrapers out of it. Now, that's really catching on in Arkansas. Walmart, whose company headquarters are in Bentonville, Arkansas, are going to build their new corporate offices out of Mass Timber. This is office space for 15,000 people. They're going to build it all out of locally grown and sourced timber from Arkansas. And at the end of the day, they'll have about 17 million pounds of carbon sequestered in their, their building for as long as that building is there. And, and you know, another kind of rule of thumb is, is wood is about 40 to 50 percent by weight of wood is pure carbon. My next question for you, Congressman, is you did hit on making the renewable or less, quote unquote, dirty energy affordable through innovation and maybe removing some of the subsidies that is provided through the government. So can you go into what your ideal solution would be for increasing that innovation while potentially getting rid of government subsidies? Or is there a position for certain government subsidies until these industries can get stood up? So first off, I think we've got to quit demonizing all fossil fuels, and we've got to look at those as forms of energy and how can we make them cleaner. Now, natural gas, it burns more efficiently. So for every unit of carbon you're emitting, you're generating more energy. So natural gas is a great fuel that can help us lower carbon emissions while we're figuring out some of these other technologies. Wind and solar have tremendous potential, but if you, and and you keep hearing, or at least I keep hearing that their cost is going down, they're comparable to other forms of energy, but if you take the, the subsidies out, they're really not. If you look at the amount of capital you have to invest to generate for kilowatt hour or megawatt hour of energy, the cost is still orders of magnitude more than what it costs for, say, hydro or nuclear or even natural gas or coal. But that doesn't mean it's not viable technology. And and we need to continue doing research. I'm always worried when we create subsidies for for anything because, in my mind, it hinders innovation. If you can make a return on your project because of the subsidy, what incentive do you have to make your product more efficient? So biofuels is another one that we need to look into. But as the engineer may just keeps coming back to nuclear power. I mean, it's something we know how to do. We can make it much more distributed with these small nuclear reactors. And plus, we've got technology now to make them much, much safer. If I were a betting man, I would say 100 years or maybe not that long from now, you're going to see a lot more nuclear power on the grid. So nuclear, this is a great question, kind of brings in the engineering, brings in the politics, brings in the carbon emissions. We've learned through school, I think a lot of us have, there's the NIMBY, not in my backyard. And after Three Mile Island and other nuclear disasters, I mean, look at Fukushima, the Germans just are decommissioning all of their nuclear and they're replacing it with coal plants. What is the political dynamic that you're seeing with your colleagues on both sides of the aisle? And do you actually think that advancing some type of pro-nuclear legislation is realistic, is possible? And can you just kind of explain that dynamic to us? I'm pro-nuclear and I really want it to happen. I just don't know if there's political reality or political will with your colleagues. Yeah. And, you know, we've got issues with spent nuclear fuel cells, the Yucca Mountain debate. But the thing about these new reactors is that you can use the spent fuel out of a first-generation reactor that still has 80 to 95% of its fuel value still left in it. 
uh, you can use that as your fuel and also decrease the half-life of the remaining product that comes out of that reactor. Now, the problem with it is, we all know, is that you're, you're creating higher-grade radioactive material when you do that. But I think that's where we have to invest more in research and development. You know, another area I didn't mention, Justin, was the uh, was hydropower. We could put about 12,000 megawatts of turbines on existing dams in our country without even building a new dam. But that's another political issue. You have people who want to tear out dams that are already there, that already have hydropower on them even. So we somehow got to find this balance between politics and science and do what's going to be right for the future because I don't think anybody wants to live without energy. And the here's another trivia question. The number one use for wood in the world today is still fuel. And if you take away fossil fuels and, and you don't have nuclear energy and if people can't meet their demands, they're, they're going to burn wood or dung or whatever is available to generate the energy they need for heat and for cooking. So we've got to keep working on the science. We've got to come up with safer, cleaner, and more efficient ways to generate energy. Okay, on to the audience. We will go to Jeff first, and then we'll go Megan, and then Dr. Francine. Jeff? Congressman, thanks so much for being here. So obviously, I think that you know the stakeholder politics of this are made more difficult by the fact that going from petroleum-based energy sources to other energy sources would require a big industrial shift and potentially disrupt a lot of economic activity. So my question would be, are there things that you think that you know fossil fuel companies or the industry can do that are constructive? Or also, are there subsidies and any things that you think would be worth subsidizing to try to jumpstart innovation and change? I think this question kind of gets back to what I was talking about on natural gas. It's, it's probably the cleanest form of fossil fuels that we have. It's a great fuel that can be easily transported, that the equipment to utilize it is not as expensive as other equipment. So you can put a lot of natural gas on the grid at a fairly low price, and you can generate energy that way. We know we can liquefy natural gas and ship it around the world. And that's another issue. As I've traveled in my role as congressman, when I go to Eastern European countries, Within 10 minutes, U.S. energy supply is a, is a question that, that comes up, and people want to get away from having to buy energy from Russia, not just Eastern Europe, but Western Europe as well. So I think it's a great strategic tool that we have with our natural gas. You know, there's a lot of different kinds of subsidies. We can subsidize research, which I think is the biggest bang for our buck. But look at corn ethanol. If you just you know, go through the math and, and do the energy balance, the amount of energy that goes into producing corn, the amount of land that it takes up, and the amount of energy that you get out of it, plus all the government subsidy that goes into it, you, you'd have to wonder if everything was based on common sense and logic, if we would have that industry out there right now. So that's what I would try to avoid, is to make sure you've got the technology right, make sure you're on a pathway to having the cleanest, lowest cost, most reliable energy source that you can and invest those government support programs or subsidies or research dollars, however you want to look at that, into those types of programs. Thank you, Jeff. We will go to Megan and then Dr. Francine and then Jefferson. Thanks, Justin. And thank you, Congressman, so much for joining us tonight. I, like Jeff and Justin, am a former House staffer been eight years with some great Republican women in the House. My question is, if you mentioned that your district is a top lumber producer, and so I'm really interested to hear your take on sort of one of the, the big economic stories of the past six months, which is lumber prices, you know, shot up, you know, made it, made it very expensive to build or remodel continued to reduce the supply of homes for sale, which of course increased home prices, would be interested to hear your thoughts on whether government action is needed to bring down lumber prices or whether there are current government actions, laws, or policies that maybe could be repealed 
to get out of the way and make the market work better. I get asked that question sometimes three or four times a day. So thanks for bringing that up. I'm the only forester in Congress. So anything that has to do with a tree, I seem to get those questions. But I actually wrote an op-ed. I think Fox News published it. Um, what caused the increase in lumber prices? And really, it's a, a combination of issues. Number one is supply and demand right now. The demand is way higher than the supply. Now, that demand is easing off because prices got so high that it started curtailing demand. But we simply don't have the mills in the country to produce the volume of lumber that's needed for all the new home building, for the pandemic projects that people did. And it's literally supply and demand on the mill side of things. The irony in the South is that we have way more timber that needs harvested than the mills can process. So while lumber prices have gone through the roof, you see landowners not getting any more for their timber when they sell it to the lumber mill. So you've got kind of two supply and demand curves there. The, the mills demand for timber from the forest landowners and the consumers demand for lumber from the mills. So you might ask, how did we get in a situation where we can't supply our demands? And, you know, looking back the last three to four decades, We've seen a mass exodus of mill infrastructure from the Pacific Northwest and even from the Intermountain region. Really, anywhere there's federal land where mills used to depend on federal land for timber supply, you've seen mills close down. We've seen close to 1,000 sawmills and wood products processing facilities close down since 2004. And we're seeing mills built in the southeastern U.S., where it's a lot of private forest land, at rapid rates. I was talking to some people who are in the business of building mills, and they said, you can't get a piece of equipment for a new mill for like two or three years now. Everything's on such a back order. One of the most eye-opening visits that I've made was back in March of this year. I was out in Wyoming and South Dakota, and I actually visited a mill, a sawmill in South Dakota that was closing down, and they were laying off 120 employees. And these were good paying jobs. This was like the the big industry in the town there. And they were they were closing down because the Forest Service cut back on the timber that they could supply to the mill. And with lumber prices at all time highs, there's only one reason a sawmill would close down is because they couldn't get logs to process. And that's exactly what was happening there with the Black Hills uh, National Forest. And it's not that the logs weren't on the forest, and it wasn't that that forest didn't need thinning for forest health. It's just that the Forest Service couldn't process the uh, paperwork to supply the logs. So now you're going to have this mill closed down, which is going to take more lumber out of the market. It's going to decrease supply, and you're going to lose all these jobs. But the real tragedy is the fact that you're not going to have infrastructure there anymore to do sound forest management on that forest. So it's going to continue to grow up and be another fire hazard. And we've seen that routine replicated over and over and over around public lands. And that's one of the things I really try to work on here in Congress is how do we put common sense back into the equation? You know, how do we get the infrastructure back so we can actually manage the forest? If you're really concerned about lumber prices, we're going to have a, uh, a natural resources forum on that topic tomorrow. It'll be live on YouTube at 10 a.m. Eastern time, and you can check that out on our Natural Resources Republican page if you want to get more information on that. Thank you, Megan. We will go uh, Dr. Francine. Hi, Congressman. Thank you for taking my question. I live in Arizona, and as you know, we have a nuclear power plant, and I was fortunate enough to be in economic development, marketing, and PR at the time the plant was built. So I got to, I got to get a fantastic education on the pros of nuclear power, and it has operated in Arizona since its inception without any problem. But my issue for you is, as I remember it, it took about 10 years of study and feasibility 
and research and so on and buying the land before anyone even knew there was going to be a nuclear power plant. And then it took maybe another five years to move the public to the point where it would allow the utility to build the plant. And you're not going to face anything much different today. Now, Arizonans mostly don't even know that they have a nuclear power plant in their backyard. But it did take a lot of work to get there. I don't see how you're going to succeed on any timeline that deals with the exigencies of climate change. Are you more optimistic? Dr. Francine, you raise an excellent point, and it's not just nuclear power plants. It's building any kind of infrastructure now. Nuclear power plants especially take forever to get permitted, and the cost, the regulatory costs that go along with it actually make nuclear power plants like we're used to seeing, like the one in Arizona, like the one that was just built over in, uh, in Georgia, make them uneconomical. I think that plant in Georgia ended up costing somewhere in the neighborhood of $12 billion, a lot more than they had budgeted for it to cost, and the timeline was extended very long. But that's one of the, the fundamental problems we need to change here in Congress is on the, the laws that govern the permitting and the regulatory side of these processes. I'm not saying we don't need stringent permitting and regulatory procedures, but it can't be something that's just used to be weaponized for people who don't want to see the development of these technologies. It has to accomplish the purpose of safety and environmental health. And there's ways that we can streamline that. We've actually, I'm on the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, and we've got a bill called, I believe it's called the Builders Act, that's looked at streamlining the regulatory environment to help decrease the timeline to build infrastructure and also to increase or streamline the permitting of infrastructure. Somebody talked about not in my backyard earlier. You're talking about being from Arizona. I'm reminded of the, the Resolute Copper Mine in Superior, Arizona. This project's been going on for a couple of decades. Oh, it's, Resolution. Uh, yeah. I've been to that mine. I rode the elevator down for over 20 minutes to get 7,000 feet below ground in this mine. The footprint at the top is very small for the size of this operation, but there's efforts in Congress to shut that mine down right now. And that one mine can produce 25% of the copper that the U.S. will need for the next 50 years coming out of that one mine. We're heavily dependent on foreign supply chains, especially when you get into rare earth minerals and, and critical minerals. China has kind of hoarded the world's market on those, but we have all of the elements and resources we need here in the U.S. So if, if we move towards a, a lower carbon energy platform that's going to require lithium and cobalt and copper and nickel and a lot of those things that we don't produce as much of as we should, we really need to start developing those elements and minerals here at home. But there's a real push not to do that here at home where we have the most stringent environmental guidelines, the best safety records, the best human rights records of anybody that would be producing these elements and minerals. So, again, there's politics at play, uh, whether it's, you know, full out building nuclear power plants or whether it's extracting lithium to make the batteries for electric vehicles. We will go to Jefferson and then John. Jefferson? Congressman, I don't live in Arkansas. Actually, um, I was born in Texas on the Gulf Coast. I grew up in Oklahoma, and now I live in West Tennessee. So, in a sense, I've, I've kind of been in orbit around Arkansas. Someday my, my, you'll move to the promised well, land. Well, my parents are from Arkansas, and their parents were born in Arkansas, and their parents were born in Arkansas, and in some cases, their parents were born in Arkansas. So I knew you sounded like a smart guy, Jeff. Well, I was just about to say it's been a pleasure to listen to somebody speak without a funny accent. <laughs> <laughs> some of your answers, I appreciate the kind of angle that you're answering some of these questions with. It, it seems like some of your concerns are the same as the at least the first concerns that float to the front of my thinking in regard to like carbon emissions, for example, and, and carbon capture or or whatever, or reducing carbon emissions. So I guess my question is, how would you, like all things being equal, how would you prefer 
to juggle the gains on carbon emissions so that the heaviest burden doesn't fall on the middle class. In essence, that they're not having to cut down all of the woodlands just to, so they can not freeze to death and not starve to death. Yeah, and it gets back to what I said about energy. It's got to be economical, which means reliable and, and lowest cost and clean. And that's how we ease the pain on everybody is to have the right energy source. And we've got to be smart about it. We've got to realize as Americans that as emitters of 15 percent of the world's greenhouse gas emissions, that we can't solve the whole problem here in America. We've got to come up with the technology and the solutions that the rest of the world will adopt. And I think that's where we've always excelled as being those innovators and the ones with the ingenuity to come up with a better way to do things. And if we just come up with new sources of energy that are expensive, that are hard to employ, the rest of the world is not going to, to mimic that. My approach, again, would be utilize natural gas as much as possible right now. Quit demonizing natural gas. Continue to develop all forms of renewables, but go wholeheartedly on next generation nuclear with the solid core cooling systems. That's on the, the side of the equation to reduce the amount of carbon going into the atmosphere. The other side of the equation is like with the Trillion Trees Act, where we're pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. And again, nothing does that better than a forest. It's God's carbon eating machine. It's the, like I said, Roosevelt called it, the lungs of the earth, breathing carbon dioxide gives off oxygen. We could make such a huge difference by taking better care of our forest here, by planting more trees here, and by exporting our expertise around the world so that you know, we can reclaim some of these, these areas that have been deforested and plus help economies around the world. There's some interesting data on correlations where there are forests and how well the economies do. Thank you, Jefferson. We will go to John. Thank you, Justin, and thank you, Congressman. So, Congressman, key industries in Arkansas, especially the agricultural industries, were heavily impacted by the tariff war with China. Um, however, today it seems as though antagonism towards China is only increasing across the government. So how can we balance this broad government approach to challenging China with the needs of Arkansas's industries and the key export market that is China? Yeah, great question. And I've, you know, I've felt that from conversations with businesses back home. But you know, if you look at our top three trading partners, China, Canada, Mexico, the USMCA helped stabilize a lot of trading markets. Getting an agreement with Japan was critical. I believe Japan's our number three trading partner. And I think what we have to do is strategically have trade negotiations with a lot more of the Pacific Rim countries. We've got to develop trade deals with South America and with European countries. And China is going to be there. They're a huge country with a huge population, with a growing economy. And I'm all for trading with China as long as it's fair trade. I think we can compete with them as long as it's a level playing field. Poultry is a huge industry in my state, and a lot of poultry was being shipped to China. And during some of the trade wars, there was a huge backlog of chicken paws, you know, chicken feet. It was like over a billion pounds of chicken feet that were in cold storage. You know, I had an opportunity to sit down with President Trump and tell him that, you know, the, the chicken farmers back home were suffering because of these trade deals. And to his credit, he got a program worked out with like a billion dollars worth of chicken paws. So it was more of a bilateral one-on-one -on -one negotiation back and forth. And I think we need to have more of those, but we've got to make sure we've got fair trade. Um, or at least somewhat of an even playing field when we're talking about trade with China. And we've got to start producing more stuff here at home that are critical to our supply chain. I think everybody realized when we couldn't get surgical masks and then found out that even the material that goes in surgical masks was made in China, and they were holding on to, to that material, even though it was 3M was the company that made it. I had... Companies all across my district volunteering to uh, to sew 
surgical mask, but literally couldn't get the material to make it. So there's some critical things, and especially you know when you start getting into rare earth elements and minerals that I believe need to be made here as well. It's not a simple question to answer, but I think we've got to do a better job on balancing our trade and not being so dependent on China. So, Congressman, I got to thank you from the bottom of my heart for your time. But what do you want to leave the audience with, Congressman? As far as the outlook for the future, I'm very positive. We have to be positive. Being negative about the future is not going to solve anything. I started off by saying, you know, my dad told me that if you point your finger and say there's a problem, there's three pointing back at you. If we'll just take the personal responsibility, whether it's in my job as a member of Congress or your jobs and in, in whatever you do, and be proactive and have a positive outlook on the future and let common sense and the science guide our decisions, I think we've got a positive future. America's always figured out how to come through troubling times, how to face our challenges, and to come out better on the other side of it. I haven't given up on that dream, and I'm not going to let it stop with my generation, and I hope nobody else is going to let it stop with their generation. So we've got to keep learning, keep working together, and keep our eye on the prize. That concludes today's conversation. Again, huge thanks to Congressman Westerman, to the House Natural Resources Committee, and most of all, to you for being here. If you like what you hear, please take a second to subscribe on whichever streaming service you're using right now so you don't miss our next episode coming this Wednesday. To learn more about Politics and Media 101 or sign up for our email list, which will deliver our best of directly to your inbox, please visit our website, pm101.live. This has been Politics and Media 101. Wherever you are in the world, thank you for being a part of this community. I'm Jeff Browning. On behalf of our co-founders, Justin Higgins and John Gunnison, we hope to hear from you soon.